Hello, I'm David Gibson, Director of the Center on Religion and Culture, or CRC, at Fordham University, the Jesuit University of New York City. And I want to welcome you to another uh, installment of our CRC Lockdown Conversations, Zoom chats from my home, with intellectuals and writers who are also working from their homes, or perhaps somewhere in the vicinity. Wherever they are, they're still contributing to this, this uh, intense national conversation about who we are and where we may be headed amid this pandemic. One of those contributors is a wonderful writer, Monica Potts, who first learned her trade here in New York City at Columbia Journalism School, and then went on to write most powerfully about uh, poverty in the other America in the wake of the Great Recession of 2008. Does anyone remember that? It seems so far uh, ago, so long ago. And especially about working class women and their struggles. Uh, she was writing at the American Prospect, most notably, and many other national outlets. Two, a little over two years ago, Monica moved back to her hometown of Clinton in rural northern Arkansas, and she has rights from there a terrific newsletter called Welcome Home. She's also working on a book about low-income women in the heartland, as we coastal types like to call it. Monica came to the attention, I think, of a lot of readers with an op-ed she wrote in the New York Times last October called In the Land of Self-Defeat, about a fight over a local library in her town there in Arkansas, and about the go-it-alone mythology of the culture and the unbeatable appeal of President Donald Trump. Monica, welcome. It's good to have you here. Um, so your best known writing is really so grounded in the stories of working class people in the wake of the Great Recession. And now here we are looking at perhaps a, um, a Great Depression and even a, um, a deadly pandemic. Um, how is that playing out in your, in your area in Northern Arkansas? Um, my particular county and the counties around us haven't been very hard hit health wise. Um, the numbers are a bit alarming in the state. We have more than 3000 cases in the state of Arkansas and we're up to nearly 60 deaths. I think it was 59 today, which is pretty substantial for, um, for a really unpopulated state. It's not anything that's, and it should be taken lightly, but for the most part, we closed down pretty early. We don't have a stay-at-home order, but the governor did shut down most businesses and, mo and schools, and that made a huge difference for people. So the impact has really been felt economically. I know my particular county has announced that they're facing a projected $500,000 shortfall, nearly $500,000, which is a substantial portion of the county budget. I think it's about a $11 million budget annually. And they announced um, cutting about half a dozen positions, some of them part-time. So um, that's what we're looking at. And we were already looking in most rural counties in the state and most rural counties around the country were already looking at really reduced and diminished budgets for our operations. And so it's on top of damage that was done during the Great Recession that never recovered as far as county budgets go. And the local economy also has taken a hit. The diner down the street for me that my grandfather went to for almost all 50 years of his working life is closing for good. So that was personally very hard. And people are eager to get back to work and for various reasons don't see the health threat as seriously as people elsewhere. Well, I'm sure, again, it's not here in New York City where we are a hot spot. You've got, you know, uh, caskets and, and, and funeral homes overflowing uh, with bodies there. So it's, it's more of an economic pain that you, you folks are feeling. Who's getting, who's getting the blame? I mean, there's a lot of folks, you know, in different areas of the country, there's a real lockdown fever uh, going on and, and there's, and people are chafing at this and want to know what the, the future is going to be and are, are resentful at a lot of the, what's happened because of this. Who are folks blaming? Um, I think folks are blaming the Democratic Party. They think the threat of the virus was overblown. The, the blame has shifted a lot. The goalposts have shifted. Um, they blamed Obama for not increasing the stockpile, stockpile of, necessary, of necessary personal protection equipment for um, healthcare workers during his tenure. Um, they blame oh, they blame China for um, 
<clears throat> early misreporting potentially of the pandemic and not getting in front of it. They don't blame Trump. They think that he's done as well as any president could have done. Um, they tend to see these things as acts of God, very literally, it's a very religious community. And so I don't think it's hard, it's really hard to prove the counterfactual that had the federal government coordinated um, response to the pandemic early, we might have seen deaths only in the low thousands, which still would have been a tragedy, but less of a tragedy than what we're facing. And it's hard to explain or prove in any way that this is worse than it could have been, um, because we don't have that alternative universe to point to. So they haven't really blamed Trump, but they do blame the Democrats for continuing to inflict economic damage on people. And they also uh, there are a lot of conspiracy theories that the virus was manufactured so that the economy would crash, which they think was doing really well under Trump. Do you think anything can change that dynamic if, uh, for example, the health situation started to change? Because there are indications that, um, you know, if there are no precautions or is, there isn't a culture of precautions, social distancing, that kind of thing, that there are rural areas could be very exposed in a second wave. Do you think any, do you think, I guess in the first place, do you think there is a, an actual health risk if folks don't take precautions? And second, do you think um, anything could change their mind in terms of who's to blame? I do think there's a health risk. There's sort of um, some amount of social distancing is built into rural life. People live farther apart. There aren't as many public spaces. We don't have public transportation. Um, but we still do have workplaces and schools that crowd people together. We have grocery stores that crowd people together. We have churches that crowd people together. So far, the churches have been mostly closed. Um, and so I think that there is a risk of um, the, one of the biggest outbreaks in the state and actually in the country on a per capita basis was in a church um, that had an event before the first positive test came back in the state in Cleburne County, Arkansas, which is next door to us. It's, they're our neighbors. And some of our first cases in this county, which is Van Buren County, came from that event. And so I can see events that spread the virus quickly like that. I can see those happening. And I think that I'm worried about that because even a small number of cases here would crash our health system. We have a hospital that has zero dedicated ICU beds. We do have um, equipment to convert normal hospital beds to ICU beds, but it's not something that's done on a normal basis. We have five ventilators and two machines that can be converted to ventilators. So even really a handful of cases could um, could really crash the health system here. And so I've been really concerned about that. And I think that seeing illness and death could change people's minds, but by then it would be too late. And so I don't want that to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, but so far I do think that I have been critical of the governor because he never, uh, Asa Hutchinson is the governor in the state. He did not issue a stay at home order, but I do think that some of the actions that he took and our lack of natural density really prevented the spread early on. And so I think that a stay at home order would backfire at this point. People would protest and it would be counterproductive. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I don't want illness and death to come here to change people's minds and prove mm -hmm. to them that they were wrong. But I do think that I worry that that is coming because there's a lot of agitation to get back to normal. The, the, one of the churches, nearby churches, was a, um, an incubator, as has happened around the world, uh, unfortunately. But I noticed in one of your um, newsletter uh, entries, you had a, a, a brief anecdote about um, uh, someone who'd seen a, um, a, a group of people chatting on the sidewalk, mentioned social distancing guidelines to them, and the woman said, quote, my God is stronger than the coronavirus God. Um, what is you know, what is the role that faith is playing there in, again, what we see as the Bible Belt, although I would argue that here in New York, you've got a lot of church going folks and, and uh, you know, a lot of them are chafing against the restrictions against uh, over worship services. But they're in the Bible Belt. Really, how, you know, there's so many ways that the people of faith are viewing this pandemic, the wrath of God, the punishment for, for doing, you know, uh, uh, for one thing or another. Um, some are, folks are weaponizing it. Some folks are seeing faith as a source of comfort. What's it like there in, in, your, in your area? 
Well, um, it's a bit of a mix as it usually is. And um, I, I want to preface everything by saying that the faith community has stepped up to a very large degree. The only, um, the only food bank near town is in a Church of Christ church, the south of town. And so they've been really serving a lot of people in this community who need it. There's another church just east of town that has passed out free meals almost every day, I think. And so as far as feeding people and keeping people comforted, comforted and safe, the churches, local churches have stepped up and they also have stepped up by closing services, which I think was a big deal, especially because as you know, the pandemic covered Easter, which was a really hard thing for this community. Um, there are other churches that have services in people's cars with speakers. And so people have really felt connected to that. And I think that the faith community has done a good job protecting their congregants. Um, but I will also say that the strain of Christian faith here, um, in general at all times, I don't want to say, um, fatalism, <laughs> but there is a strain of religious belief here that does believe that this earth is not our home. This world is not our home. That's something that I feel and hear a lot. And so there's no reason to fear death. And that something is something I've heard my entire life. And so if it's your time, God will take you and there's nothing that can be done about it. And so all of these efforts to prevent death or to prevent illness are um, futile because it's God's will. And so I do see that playing a role in the way that people view taking action against an illness and protecting themselves. And that quote was really illustrative of that, is that if, you know, if it is God, if God sees it as your time to come home, um, then there's nothing that you can do to prevent that. And I don't see people being that careless anymore um, with that in mind, but I do see that sort of mutes criticism of government officials and health officials that might have taken action sooner. That's a fascinating point because we're having that debate very much, um, even here in, in the United States with uh, Rusty Reno and others at First Things Magazine, which you, you may know, which has taken on a, a certain fatalistic aspect uh, approach, uh, believing that, again, as you say, that uh, there are things worse than death and that uh, the suffering caused by the economic shutdown is uh, is really paramount, um, and that you know Christians of all people shouldn't run and hide. There's an, let me just uh, pick up on that. There is an interesting debate about what's going to happen because you have had, apart from you, you get a few instances of, of of pastors you know holding huge services in contravention of policies or suggestions or guidelines, but you have had a vast the vast majority of churches shutting down. And some people say that's going to be a problem because when they do open up, people are not going to come back. But others say it's akin to, again, this witness of, of faith, of Christian solidarity that you describe is really speaks well of the Christian community. And this could be, frankly, something of a, a revival of sorts. How do you see that? Um, I think that's really possible. One of the nice things about, um, you know, there, there has been a decline in church attendance in rural America as well. And I don't have specific numbers about the decline here, but there are a lot of older brick and mortar churches that have been nearly empty on some Sundays. There are new churches, non-denominational congregations that have sprung up around this, around the state and around this county in particular and this region in general. Um, so church attendance has been shifting anyway. But one of the challenges of the churches here, and I'm sure churches everywhere, is dealing with the graying of the population. And so we have much older congregants who have always struggled to get to church on Sunday. And one of the nice things that I've seen and one of the challenges I've seen the faith community here meet is holding uh, Facebook Live um, uh, sermons and inviting people to join their congregations remotely and virtually. And I think that that has been a really a boon because people do want to feel connected. They don't want to be isolated in their homes. And every week they have this opportunity to join in a service and a community that they might not otherwise have skipped on a Sunday morning. And so I've seen that be good. I don't know how that will hold up or whether they'll continue doing things like that when all of this is over, but I think for now it's net good for sure. Uh, one thing I was just going to pick up on the, um, the live streaming, which has been a boon to so many people, my own mother and, and people who are elderly people who are homebound because of this. Uh, what is high speed internet there in a rural area uh, where you are? You know, I'm thinking not just of church services, but so many other ways to connect with people. 
via Zoom and also for kids who, who may have to go to school uh, you know, uh, remotely? How, how is that, uh, what is your infrastructure there? Um, it's actually, it's not the worst here. Um, we don't have the best, it's expensive and it's not very fast and it's ver a varying reliability, but we do have two different service providers. We pay more for a faster, for a slower service than we did when I lived in suburban DC. So we just personally, we pay almost a hundred dollars a month for, I believe it's um, two gig uh, internet streaming and um, that includes a house phone that we have to have. <laughs> so it's not cheap. We paid much less in DC um, for better service, but I think that cell phone service is also good and people use that frequently much many more people are connected through their mobile phones and other devices than they are through for land-based internet services interesting one one also um uh, observation you made in a recent um, newsletter you said um you know in, in in conjunction with or in connection with the way you approach your writing that um small towns can tell big stories, uh, which I, I wholly agree with. Um, and, and individual stories are, are as big as anything. I'm so pleased with the way so many local newspapers here, for example, have dedicated themselves to writing obituaries of all of the victims uh, of the coronavirus, because I think that is such an important community connection there to tell the stories of individual people. But you also noted that there's a struggle against, quote, any an overwhelming sense of stasis and that, quote, there just aren't many, very many fights and arguments and big debates. Why is that in your community? This is something I've been puzzling over, and I don't know if I have the exact answer, except that I think it's important to continue to try to unravel in writing and in reporting. Um, I, my first job as a, as a reporter, reporter was at the Stanford Advocate in Stanford, Connecticut. New England has a wonderful tradition of, um, town and citizen involvement in local government. And they're very active in local government and also in local newspapers. And so that was a really educational time for me to see the ways in which local citizens pushed back on every little decision that was made and wanted to know all of the details and get all of the documents. So I think that that is one thing that I took for granted at that time. That just doesn't happen here. I think it's partly that, um, overall the population is less educated and i think that edu formal education engenders that sort of series of questioning and seeking information and also feeling entitled to it that would enable citizens to push back against their leaders i think that's something that you learn to do especially in college and so i think that overall that hasn't been part of the culture here is to think about questioning authority and think of thinking about demanding answers from the people who are making decisions. So it's just such much more of a feeling of trust and leadership. I think that the aspect of religion here also plays a role in that where, you know, an important Christian value for people here is to trust in authority, both in God's and in the people that God has um, appointed to be your local leaders. And so deferring to authority is kind of built into a lot of people's worldview and, and world being way of being in the world. Um, and also, um, I think that there hasn't been, there aren't any big newspapers here. Um, and a lot of newspapers in really small towns are, you know, they're very good at what they do, but they're essentially community bulletin boards and they have to get along with the local businesses and the local government so that they can get the ad dollars that those places still provide. And they have to work with county officials and they have to see those people every day. And everyone has to see everyone every day almost. If you go to the grocery store, the chances that you're gonna run into somebody who you've had a fight with online are very, very high. <laughs> and so I think that that sort of engenders this kind of going along to getting along. Just, you know, there's this tendency I know a lot of people who say when they want to complain about something, they preface it by saying, well, I'm not in charge, but <laughs> and so I think there's a lot of that attitude is that, you know, <clears throat> um, who am I to say this, but I think maybe this could change. And so that's something that I've sort of been trying to document and push back on and think about and think about my role here and what that means for me too. 
That's a wonderful mission. Uh, I'm also a Stanford Advocate alum from, from way back before your time even. So it was a great pay. And that's, again, one of the, uh, I think we're seeing in real time, one of the other casualties of this economic shutdown and pandemic are, is local media. It's already been happening, and I think it's uh, another topic for another time, but potentially devastating, especially for at the mid-sized papers, the local papers, and, and keeping communities informed and together. Um, uh, one final point, where, where do you see things going now? What is the way forward for a community like yours in Northern Arkansas? I mean, again, you start, you've been writing about this for years, is this, these problems of especially rural communities, uh, the economic uh, deprivation that goes on, this, this migration that's, every crisis seems to bring further out migration to the cities. Uh, and look at what we're facing now. Look at the prospects going ahead. Is there any hope for a community like yours? Um, you know, this is something I also think about a lot. I, I wrote about a community in, in coal country in Kentucky um, last year, actually. And one of the things somebody said to me at the, uh, that was at the end of the piece was, um, this is paraphrasing, but sort of one of the first questions that you have to ask yourself is what do you do with the land? And he meant that in a very literal way of the land that we're sitting on. And he was speaking from a town that wouldn't have existed, but for coal and coal is largely gone. And so what is the purpose then of these towns being where they are on the earth? And, um, you know, that's something I think about, and I think a lot about rural America as a whole, but rural America is very, very varied and diverse. Most of the counties in the country, more than 70%, depending on how you count them, are considered rural. They have less than 20% of the total population. So most of this vast swath of place that we call America is people living in not very dense places, in not very vibrant economies, and, um, Overall, the median person there is older and white. Um, there are different counties with higher populations of African Americans. That's part of rural life too, and I don't mean to say that it's not. And there are a lot of counties within a, a very increasing and booming and vibrant economy, largely thanks to an immigrant population from Central America. So th those are all rural economies as well. The places that are welcoming new immigrants and welcoming the arts and welcoming things like cultural institutions that are subsidized by local and state governments and so subsidized by local patrons, those places are doing much better. Um, any rural community that has an art center, any rural community that has a large population of um, new immigrants opening restaurants and opening new businesses, those places are doing better. The places that are suffering are the places that are getting older, and not as welcoming to new places and also don't have quite a reason for being that is relevant in today's economy. And um, I think a lot about this community and what that means and what it could mean. There is a hunger to, I think among some people to at least maintain the idea of being able to move to a green, vibrant, empty space with a lot of quiet and dark skies. Um, that is available here. There's a lot of natural beauty. We're in the southern part of the Ozarks. There's a nat national river that's preserved just north of here that's very beautiful. Um, there's a big lake here that is um, the source of a lot of local tourism dollars. I think that any community that's going to have to, that's going to survive has to think about what it is that it in particular has to offer and how it can support it. And, and that means supporting it with money that might come from somewhere else. And it means supporting it with all of your effort, And it means protecting it, protecting it against forces that might be trying to do something else to your community that don't, doesn't really belong there. Um, and so that's what I think about a lot. And I know how that might look here in my head. I don't know how that looks on somebody's spreadsheet or balance sheet and whether it's possible. And I don't know how that looks elsewhere in rural America. Monica Potts, thank you so much for talking to us and what you're doing to make that vision a reality and to also just convey to us what the culture there and what life is like in your beautiful writing. Um, you're writing a book for Penguin Random House um, and congrats, good luck with that. Um, but also your, your newsletter, Welcome Home, uh, monicabpotts.substack.com. 
uh, definitely go and sign up for that. It's terrific reading. It's been great to talk to you. And I even hear your cat. <laughs> you didn't get <laughs> no, you didn't get to hear my dog this time. So it's uh, <laughs> what, he must be heard. <laughs> yeah. No. If there if there's a, a Zoom interview that doesn't feature my dog, it's um, it's it's a rarity. So it's it's great to talk to you, to hear your cat, to hear of life there in northern Arkansas. And we pray for you and hope uh, again you do or do stay safe uh, from the pandemic. And also, uh, above all, that the, um, the, the economic uh, winds that are blowing um, are also turn around in some way and, and benefit uh, to your benefit. So thank you very much again for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure.